All right. Um, it's a Friday afternoon. I'm recording a video on trigonometry. So please excuse me if I make some mistakes. It's Friday afternoon. Uh, that's it. Um, this is the first of two lessons looking at section 5.2 from the textbook, which is looking at transformations of sinusoidal functions. Sinusoidal functions are variations of sine and cosine, waves. Tangent is not a sinusoidal function. We'll look at tangent in a few lessons. It does not, it's not a wave. It's, it's different. Um, and we come back to transformations. And so if I look back at this, whether I'm looking at sine or cosine, what this A, this B, this H, and this K represent is all stuff we've done before. Um, and so I'll give us a few new terms. Uh, when we're dealing with waves, I mean, there's a few kind of special terms for it, but all these transformations we've seen before. And so for example, the A here. Uh, that represents a vertical stretch by a scale factor of A. Right, whatever the coefficient is, is your scale factor. Now actually, I'm, I'm going to put absolute value brackets around this again, because if A is negative, the scale factor is still positive, but it's also a reflection. So then I'll say if A is less than 0, there's also a vertical reflection. I'll just put reflection. Actually, no, I'll put vertical reflection. Why not? OK. So the B value, uh, it's being multiplied into the function. That represents a horizontal stretch by a scale factor of, I'm hoping everyone knows I'm not going to say B, I'm going to say 1 over B, or the absolute value of it, actually. Right, the reciprocal of that. If B is negative, we have a horizontal reflection. All right. Uh, the H value, what's being added to just the input, that's a horizontal translation. I will say, when you're dealing with sinusoidal functions, um, we tend to also use the phrase phase shift, which, will c which I'll start talking about in a moment. And so the, anytime we start hearing the word phase shift, the phrase that's the same as a horizontal translation, it's just specific to a wave. But a horizontal translation, I'll say minus, minus h units. Right? If you're adding, it goes to the left. You're subtracting, it goes to the right. Um, so I'm just recording right now. So I'll be recording for a while. I never get to see this stuff. I know. It's exciting, isn't it? So I'm now being interrupted by Mr. McKenzie, who is, uh, I guess he has a question for me. There's no pause button. There's no pause button. No. I'll be done probably in about 15 minutes. Yeah. Sorry. He gave me the sign for speed it up. So I will try to speed it up. That was probably the most exciting part of the entire video. It just happened right now. Anyways, um, so lastly, the k value is a, is a vertical translation. And again, just whatever k is. If it's positive, it goes up. Negative, it goes down. I did that pretty quick because I think I can. Um, there's nothing really new about that. All right, so all of this here, same ideas we've seen before in the course, and we'll continue to see afterwards. We didn't deal with transformations in chapter four, but here we are again here. OK, so again, a few more things that are mostly review. Amplitude, again, is we saw last day the absolute value of your A value. We also saw it can be figured out using this formula that will start to become more useful, max minus min divided by 2. OK, all that will tell you the amplitude. The period or wavelength uh, we, saw, we saw is affected by the horizontal stretch. And the period of wavelength can always be found by taking 2 pi and dividing by b. And we ended up doing that last day. Although if b is negative, our period or wavelength is always positive. So we'll put absolute value brackets around this. Or if we're dealing with degrees, which we won't do very often, it'll be 360 divided by b. But again, we will very rarely deal with degrees here. Uh, here's that phrase phase shift, which I set up here is the same as horizontal translation. Same thing. And again, it's always, in this case, minus h units. And the center line, uh, which I talked about last time, or the fancier term for it is the sinusoidal axis, if you want to sound extra smart. The center line is the middle of the wave, halfway between the top and the bottom. That's always the same as your k value, if it's written in this form, is y equals k. 
All right. Really important right there. I know I did it quickly, uh, but most of that is review. The main new part are some of these phrases, phase shift, sinusoidal axis, um, but they all refer back to transformations we've seen. So the next thing I have here is like a six, a six step process uh, that is, uh, is basically just my advice uh, with how to visualize waves as, a, as the equations get more complex. And last day in our notes, we did look at some transformations, but fairly simple ones. As you get more complex, I recommend just trying this, okay? Um, and so let me kind of work through this. So the first thing it says is look at an equation and sketch the center line. If your equation is in a fairly standard form, you should be able to see the center line quite quickly. And so if I look right here, might also look at my equation, uh, I can see my center line is going to be at two. And so I'm gonna look at my graph and I know my graph will oscillate up and down around two on the Y axis. So look at my scales, that's gonna be right here. So that's my center line, Y equals two. Well, that was easy. Okay, what's next? Next, use the amplitude to sketch the highest and lowest points my wave will get to. So if I look right here, my amplitude is three, right? Not negative three, my amplitude is three. And so I know my wave will reach a highest point three above the center line or three below the center line. So along here, that's three above the center line or along here, that's three below the center line. And so that is my maximum height and this is my minimum height. So I'm just gonna kind of show that. What I'm essentially doing is I'm taking a complex wave and I'm trying to break it down to starting with its easiest parts. So I now know my wave will oscillate up and down something like this. Now I don't know exactly the period or what the specific points, but I do know what's constrained in there. Okay, next, step three. Uh, think about where my wave starts, and this depends on either sine or cosine. So sine starts on the center line, cosine starts at a max or a minimum. Um, so first let's look at that. Now here, if I look at its cosine, but I have a transformation that I need to kind of see properly by factoring out the two x here. So I'm gonna put this step on hold for a moment and factor out the two in front of the x. So if I do that, I get two times x minus pi over four, because I'm dividing by two. And so all of this is inside my cosine function being multiplied by negative three and having two added to it. Okay, so I have a cosine function. So cosine, if there's nothing else going on, cosine starts right there. When x is zero, the output is at its maximum. Well here, I have a cosine function that is being translated pi every two units to the right. So if I look on here, pi over, sorry, sorry, pi over two, uh, pi, uh, pi over four it should be. I blame Mr. McKenzie. All right, so I can see I have a cosine function that, again, if, it was, if there was no phase shift, if there was no horizontal translation, it would start where my orange circle is. But I have to now do two things. I have to realize, no, it's actually gonna be translated pi over four to the right, which is right here, looking at the scale of my graph, right there's pi, so each of my grid lines vertically is pi over four. And there's one more thing I gotta notice, that this there's a negative in the front, which is a vertical reflection. So my graph is actually, the first point I'm gonna draw is right here. So I'll draw it in blue. So right here is the first point I know my graph goes through with in detail. And again, that's probably the hardest part for a lot of students, or right up there. And again, so to remind you how I figured it out, it's a cosine function. Cosine starts at the maximum of the wave. It's been reflected vertically, so that makes it start at the bottom of the wave. And it's been translated pi over four units to the right, so hence I know my wave starts. I say starts because it really doesn't start anywhere. It goes on forever. It's just really my starting point. I know my graph goes to that point. That is a huge step done, and that is step four. Um, three. And so notice I always put starts in quotes because my graph doesn't really start inherently anywhere. That's where I'm gonna start drawing it. Next, and the last big difficult step, is to use the period to find you know, another point that I know it must go on. So what do, what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at my graph here. The period of cosine is normally two pi, but there's a two right here. 
All right. So the period of this function will not be 2 pi. The period of this function will be 2 pi divided by b, 2, which is just pi. So I know that my particular wave here will repeat one complete cycle every pi units. So how is that helpful? Well, let's look back at my graph. I know if I go from that point, if I go pi units this way or pi units this way, I will have the same point. The wave will repeat. So I'm going to go to the right. Now, what's pi units? I've got to look at the scale of my graph. This particular graph, pi units is four grid lines. So I'm literally just going to look at my scale and count four grid lines. One, two, three, four. So I know my wave not only must go through that line, I know this is one full period. This is one full wavelength. This is a huge step done. Because I know my wave now must look something like this. Now it's kind of crappy drawing. But I know it has to look something like that. It's one full period. So now let me make it a little less crappy. Um, I know halfway, no, those are two minimum points. I know halfway between them, it must reach a peak right there. So maybe I'll erase my little lousy drawing. OK. And so again, halfway between the two bottom points, I must have my peak. And again, halfway between here and here, it must cross the center line. So I know it must cross the center line here, and then again, right here. And so with that said, I've now drawn the key points of one full cycle. So something like this. That said, it's a lot easier if I just continue this pattern now. It should be pretty easy to complete the pattern. It actually works out quite nicely with the grid lines I've given you. So here's another cycle. And so on. And I'll complete one more cycle going backwards. Like I said, while there's a lot of complexity here, waves, once you see the wave, a wave is a pretty simple pattern to repeat. There you go. I just drew three full cycles of my wave, okay, of a very complex wave. So before I look at one more example of this, essentially all the steps I did were about first starting with the easiest parts, the center line, the maximum, to kind of get the basic side, the basics of it. Then pick a starting point, and for that I have to think about the phase shift and think about how sine and cosine behave, and then the period to kind of get a sense for how the whole wave must behave. It's tough, but. You know, I've only given you one example. So let me show you one more example that actually might end up being a bit easier. OK, so here, first notice the graph has all whole values on it. Nothing's in terms of pi, which there's a reason for that. We'll see. That's in my equation. Looks kind of messy, but don't be thrown off by how it looks. Let's follow the same steps. Let's first start with the center line. My center line's at 1. I know my wave will oscillate up and down around y equals 1. OK, what's next? Amplitude is 2. So I know the highest point this graph will get is 2 above my center line and 2 below. OK, so there's my max. There's my min. OK, next, this is where things get trickier. Um, I need to find a starting point. Well, it's a sine function. Sine starts at the center line. And so if there was no translation, there's a hor there is a horizontal translation right there. But if that wasn't there, let's pretend for a moment it was just x. If there was no phase shift, it was no horizontal translation, I know my graph would go through that point right there. Because that you know, sine starts at the center line and then goes up. That's how sine behaves. It's, you know, and that all goes back to memorizing how the sine function looks. Sine starts at 0 and goes up as you look from left to right. Whereas cosine starts at 1, the max, and goes down. That's it. I can't ignore the fact that there is a horizontal translation here. And so I know my graph uh, is actually, my starting point is going to be 1 to the left of what I just drew. So right there. And I know there's a negative in the front. So I know my wave is not going to behave like this. My wave is going to behave like this. It's going to, from that center line point, it's going to start going down. Because that is, you know, if you take a sine wave and you reflect it vertically, It'll, you know, from the starting point, it'll start going down if you treat zero as being your starting point. Well, that's it. Right up there with the hardest part of this. If that's not the hardest part, the next step is, which is the understanding how the period can help us. Well, what's the period of this function? This function has a period of not pi over 4, that's my b value. Uh, the period of this function is 2 pi divided by my b value. 
which again, this may look complex, but it's actually gonna be a pretty pleasant period as long as we just remember, you know, honestly, grade eight math, which is how do you work with fractions? Well, two pi divided by pi over four is the same as two pi times the reciprocal, four over pi. Okay. And then notice my pi's cancel out. And so my period is two times four, which is eight, not eight pi, eight. Number eight, it's a pretty nice number, which means from that point right here, if I go eight units to the right, or eight, to the, eight units to the left, I'll complete one cycle. So if I go eight to the right, I have this point right here. This is one period. That is a huge step done. So this is a sine function, right? So I know between those two points is one period. From this starting point, I'm gonna highlight in blue, I know it's gonna go down first because again, I have this vertical reflection right here. And so I know it's gonna look something like that. To make it a little more neat, I know halfway between these two points, it's gonna reach the center line again. So I know it's gonna go through there. I know halfway between these two points, it's gonna reach the bottom. And halfway between these two points, it's gonna reach the top. So let me erase all my little circles here. And I now have, pretty quickly, five points um, that, hold on, I, oh, I drew, I can tell I made a mistake actually, because if I look at this, this doesn't look even anymore. My wave is not, you know, this distance is too long, and that's because I miscounted my period. The good thing is, a wave, like I keep saying, is a pretty simple shape actually. The mathematics behind it aren't simple, but the shape is pretty simple, and so I just, I realized I miscounted my period. It should have gone to here. So the halfway point will be right here, and then the bottom of the wave and the top of the wave. All the ideas I had before were correct. I just miscounted one point. And now I could draw my wave, one cycle of it. And why stop there? I can just continue my, my pattern. I want to do a little bit more right here. There's my graph of pretty complex equation. Minus 2 times the sine of pi times x plus 1 over 4 plus 1. And I'm not saying it was easy to do, but in some ways, that period actually of 8, uh, which all came down to the fact that my b value was pi over 4, uh, actually led to, in some ways, a pretty pleasant graph with just whole values for x and y. All right. With that, let me, th that was tough. Don't, I don't expect you to be an expert at that too quickly. That's it. The next thing is I want to just get a quick sense of some basics of a graph without actually having the graph drawn. Um, I say here a sinusoidal function has the following characteristics. So let's, let's sketch this. A maximum, a maximum at pi over 4 comma 10 and the next minimum to the right at 3 pi over 2 comma negative 2. Okay, let's just start drawing some of this out. So I'm going to make a quick little sketch. Um, and uh, I'm not going to put a ton of effort into where I put these points. I definitely want to pay attention to the signs. So for the point I've highlighted in yellow, pi over 4 comma 10, I don't know, I'll call that pi over 4 to the right, 10 up, I don't know, how about right here? It doesn't really matter. I can set my scales up any way I want. As long as it's in the first quadrant, I'm good. Hello. Hello. And so next, I have another point that for 3 pi over 2 comma negative 2, all that matters is 3 pi over 2 is more than pi over 4. So it has to be more to the right of my previous point, and it has to be below the x-axis because the y coordinate is negative 2. So I don't know, I'll kind of call it, I don't know, right here. And it says that this point is a maximum, and this is the closest minimum to the right, which means I know my wave must look something like this. It must go down and then reach there, and then it, that means it must go back up and go on and on in either direction. Okay, so that's what I've kind of visualized right here. So the question is, find the coordinates of the next maximum to the right, which means really the coordinates of this point right here. Okay, that's my question. Well, the good thing is, I already know one of those. I know the y coordinate has to be 10. Because, you know, this is my maximum. So even though my drawing is kind of lousy in terms of the detail, uh, I know that y coordinate has to be 10. So all that's left is what's my x coordinate? How can I figure out my x coordinate? Well, to do that, I really need to figure out my period. 
And how do I figure out my period? I look at my graph here and realize, OK, if I look at this point right here, from here to here is half my period. Right From the top to the bottom is half the wave. But whatever distance that is, is the same thing from there to there. So really, I just need to figure out what's the distance, what's the difference between pi over 4 and 3 pi over 2. I don't know off the top of my head. Let's do some quick little math, right? If this was a 2 and this was a 5, the difference would be 3, because 5 minus 2 is 3. Well, they're not whole numbers, but the same idea. So I can find that difference by going 3 pi over 2 minus pi over 4. And once I find my common denominator and subtract, I will know half my period. And so to find a common denominator changes to a 4, changes to a 6. And in my numerator, I have 6 pi minus pi, which is 5 pi, over 4. So that there is not the period. That is half the period. Right? That's the distance from the, you know, literally this line I'm drawing in red, real dark right here. And so that distance is 5 pi over 4, which means this distance is 5 pi over 4, which means altogether the period must be 10 pi over 4. Right, so now I know what the period. The period is 10 pi over 4, which I could reduce to 5 pi over 2. However, though, I actually don't want to, because if I look back at what the question is asking us to figure out, this is actually, I'd rather deal with 5 to 10 pi over 4, because I now need to take that distance of 10 pi over 4 and add it to my x coordinate right there, which is already has a denominator of 4. So in the end, uh, I can figure out this last remaining unknown x coordinate if I just take pi over 4 and add the period, which I said was 10 pi over 4. Or you have a common denominator, it's 11 pi over 4, and that's my missing coordinate. And so this is a tough question. Um, even though my calculations are all kind of straight out of grade 8, except for the pi, I mean, I'm just adding, multi, you know, dealing with fractions. Um, it's, but in order to get this correct, you have to be able to, you know, besides understand all the terminology, you have to be able to visualize and, under and inherently understand the connection between these distances and the period and whatnot. Um, again, most students find these things tough, although in the end, I did a fair amount of work, but look at my calculations. I'm adding fractions. I'm subtracting fractions. I'm not doing a lot of complex calculations for a most likely a difficult question. All right, the last question. Uh, is a Ferris wheel question. It's actually a pretty common type of trigonometric applied question, just because most of you have probably been on a Ferris wheel in your life, so it's a good sort of question to ask because you can kind of visualize some things. Um, but as it says here, the height of a point in rotation over time can be modeled using a sinusoidal function. Okay, and I'll say more about that in a bit. A function that models the height in meters after t minutes for a person getting on this Ferris wheel in London is shown below. So this equation right here, which right now I've just given you, will tell you the height a person is above the ground, or above the river actually, it's over the River Thames, um, if you know how many minutes they've been on the ride for. Okay, That's what this equation tells you. Um, now, I made this equation using a little bit of information I found out about the London Eye, the Ferris wheel. Um, by the next lesson, we should be able to come up with an equ equation on our own. Okay, so right now though, just keep in mind as weird as messy as, as this equation may look, it doesn't actually require anything too crazy. Uh, but for the time being, I'm just giving you the equation. Okay, what do we want to do? We want to sketch what one complete cycle of this wave. Um, and keep in mind, this is referring to an actual Ferris wheel that chances are some of you have been on. I mean, it's a pretty famous world tourist attraction. I mean, London's a pretty major city, right? So there's a chance that you've been on this. Um, and so my graph that whatever we sketch, the key points of it should represent something related to this Ferris wheel. That's it. How do I sketch this? Well, first, when I sketch my axes, I don't want to sketch something like this. Because if this is time and this is height, well, this is referring to negative time, which actually does make sense in this case. That's time before you got on. But I don't want to show that. This represents negative height, which in this case means it's in the water, because this is over a river. I definitely don't want to include that. So I only want to include my first quadrant. So for my graph, I want to sketch something. Actually, I'll make it nice and big, since that is the whole question. I'm going to sketch something like this. And this is time in minutes, and this is height in meters. All right, 
Next, let's kind of go back to the sort of thing, my advice I gave on how to sketch something like this. Let's start with what I think is the easiest part, the center line, 75. So 75 meters is the middle of my wave. So I know I'm just going to pick a point on my graph. I don't know, maybe right here. And that's my center line. OK, next, the amplitude is 60. So now I can figure out the max and the min. The maximum height is going to be 60 above 75. 60 plus 75 is 135. So that's the maximum height the Ferris wheel reaches. That's it. I also have the minimum. Don't assume it's at zero. In fact, if a Ferris wheel touches the ground, when it rotates, the whole thing's going to roll away. So the, max, the minimum height is probably above the ground. Again, if the, if the amplitude is 60 and the center line is 75, go 75, take away 60, which is 15. OK, so I've got the sort of main structure of my wave setup. Next, this graph has no phase shift. This graph has no horizontal translation. That's nice, actually. So next, I can plot my starting point. A cosine function starts at the maximum. So this is not correct yet. But a cosine function, if it's positive, starts at the maximum. So if that was the case, it would start up there. However, notice there's a negative in the front. So I have to imagine that being reflected vertically. So my cosine function won't start up there. Oh, I got a little overzealous with what I got to erase there. Can I get there? We go. My cosine wave is going to start at the bottom, which makes sense. That represents the time you got on the Ferris wheel. So that point there represents the instant you got on the Ferris wheel, time zero. And at that point, you're 15 meters above the river. Okay. Uh, so this, this, the starting point of this Ferris wheel is suspended over the river, about 15 meters above the river. Okay. Next, I have to use the period to find another point. So for this, the period, I got to figure out by looking at uh, the b value, which is pi over 15. So what's the period? The period can always be found by going 2 pi divided by your b value. In this case, 2 pi divided by 15. And hopefully now, after the last question, or a question, uh, second to last question, this doesn't look so intimidating. 2 pi divided by pi over 15, the same as 2 pi times 15 over pi. Again, my pi's cancel out. 2 times 15 is 30. So my period is 30, but not just 30 units, 30 minutes, because my x-axis is time in minutes. And so not only can I put another dot right here and label it 30, you know, the, I now know it takes 30 minutes to go around, which is true. This, you know, the ride takes 30 minutes to go all the way around. The Ferris wheel takes 30 minutes. And so once I have that done, well, I know halfway between 0 and 30, it must <coughs> reach its peak. And so what is that? What are the units of that? That's 15 over and 135 up. That means I know at 15 minutes, after 15 minutes, you're at the top of the ride, and you're 135 meters above the river. And if I want, I could, you know, I'm going to, you know, I could figure out these coordinates here and here. These would be halfway between, uh, you know, for example, this is at 7.5 and this is at 22.5. But at this point, I have more than enough to sketch my wave. So I'll kind of sketch my wave, look something like this. There we go. Okay, and there is my sketch of one full cycle of this function. This represents the moment you got on the Ferris wheel. This represents when you're at the top and it starts going back down, this represents when they kick you off. All right? Um, and so keep in mind, if you look at all the work we've done today, um, most students start to find aspects of this quite challenging. But as always, it's not the calculations that are challenging. And so right now, if you're finding things challenging, I would start by making sure you have completely memorized how sine and cosine behave. Otherwise, when I talk about sine starting at the center line and going up, that doesn't really make much sense right away. If I talk about cosine starting at the maximum and going down, that doesn't make much sense until you have those basic sine and cosine functions memorized and internalized. And then you can just visualize that and have that feeling right away. That is so important. Okay, Key lesson here. Big lesson done. Oh, I can stop talking.